I had a huge poster of Heath Ledger as the Joker and I put it above my bed. And I just want to say to my college roommate at the time, Alex Pack, I am so sorry. Yeah, what Because the fuck? you had to wake up every morning and look at the Joker. And that was something I didn't even think about till years later and a chill ran up my spine. Oh, nothing makes me want to fuck out my college hormones like Heath Ledger's bloody white painted face. You are a real asshole. Welcome to Keep It, cricket media show about pop culture and politics and what happens when they smack into each other at an alarming speed. I'm your host, Ira Madison III. I'm a television writer and Fallout Boy fan. I'm Louis Fertel. I'm a TV writer and Jane Fonda historian. Let's get into it. And we're back. And when I say we, I'm using the word liberally because it's just me, Louis Fertel, one of the co-hosts of Keep It. Ira is not here this week. He is in Colombia, I assume, sorting out Shakira's taxes. I don't know what else he'd be doing there. But uh, I'm here this week. I was not here last week. Ira co-hosted with Jay Jordan, who is fabulously funny. Uh, loved the episode. And also our guest that week was Tori Kelly, who since then uh, has been admitted to the hospital with blood clots. We wish the best for Tori Kelly, who was a phenomenal talent. Loved listening to her last week, too. Blown away by that news. Um, this week, we have, uh, I mean, one, one of my sisses. Uh, uh, I will now introduce him using not SAG credits because we're in a, a tumultuous time in the entertainment world. But he is a writer. He is a comic. He is a musical comedian, which I razz him about constantly, like he's in a mighty wind or something. He's fabulously funny. He was great on Celebrity Jeopardy earlier this year. And... Please make him feel welcome, because aside from his 700 episodes of Los Culturistas with Bo and Yang, he has never done a podcast before. So please welcome my girl, my boy, Matt Rogers. Like a virgin, here I am, trying my hand at podcasting in this new era where I can't act anymore. But, but guys, if you Google me, there's at least three credits that you'll recognize. That's right, yes. I uh, assume so if you're a very gay person that listens to this, or a woman. Right, nobody else, though. <laughs> I just assume we share a demographic. I want to ask you, is there a first name that pops out most often when someone says they're a fan of the podcast and come up? Because everyone's name that listens to my podcast is Katie. Oh, sure. Interesting. Uh, I think it does run female ultimately, but mm -hmm. I want to say it's maybe maybe a few years older than the Katie demographic. Okay. So I think we're hitting into Cheryl's. And, Cheryl's, but, but of of varying spellings. So it could be Cheryl Lee Ralph. It could be mm -hmm. Cheryl Hines, whom yeah. we love at the moment because of RFK Jr. If I trust anyone with a Cheryl, it's you. Oh, please. Crow, I'll take you through the entire greatest hits. I'll take you through most of her albums. Do you know what gets lost about Cheryl Crow? And I'm so happy you've said her name. Sure. I was talking to someone who's like in the music industry, and you know that she came up as a background singer. She has perfect pitch apparently t like in terms of her tonality she's rarely off someone that was like recording in the studio with her said that she gets everything on the first or second take that she's like a whiz in the studio like her singing is like you know pretty peerless in terms of like what she's able to deliver in terms of recording takes and everything and i just thought that was so fascinating because you don't think of cheryl crow and think one of the best singers but like her background in yeah yeah right exactly but but she is that which I wow. thought was fascinating. So she's somebody who, if she wanted to, could record like karaoke tracks for a living, and then we could all sing along with her. Also, that kind of makes sense to me because she basically got the background singing gig for Michael Jackson out of nowhere in the '80s, and then was suddenly thrust on the giant bad tour with him. So it kind of makes sense that she's that technically good. You have to imagine that he was picky about about right. his his girls. He would menacingly pat bubbles and think, I need a frizzy-haired Missourian woman with perfect taste. <laughs> yes. Remember just like when I was growing up, like my I had an uncle who's, who, who's really, I'm very estranged from now. And at the time he was like, um, you know, what's cool about uh, Cheryl Crow and Alanis Morissette is they're huge, but they have bad voices. I was oh, like, what are you talking about? Thank you, and heterosexuality. He, thank yeah, you. and he was he was like, yeah, don't you, like, Cheryl Crow is not like a good singer, but she's big, right? And like Alanis Morissette, she's got a weird voice, but she's big, right? And I was just like, God, I think that was where I first turned away from a heterosexual opinion. And God, and, yes. And, right. and I just flung myself in the other direction. I, well, I uninvited him from my home, as it were. Oh, thank you. Wow, you really 
you're trying to turn me on today with your I'm on Keep It. Reference. Yes. I'm on Keep It. What am I going to do? Wow. I'm co hosting this podcast with my three time sexual partner, Louis Vertel. <laughs> I guess it would be thrice. Wow. This is yeah. totally going to turn into like a Who's Afraid of Virginia Wolf like <laughs> duel. Except I'm Martha and you're Honey. So it's like a totally I... different play. Wow, for you to give me honey is so huge because right. I know that like while people might assume you want to be Martha, I so I, I so know you want to be honey. You but are I do think I'm more of a honey that. type. Right, definitely, definitely. On that tip, I just want to say in college I took a pop music class and it was a woman who her most of her studies were in the Beatles, but she taught a, a entire pop music curricul- curriculum and she played tapestry for us. We finally got to a female singer. I was suspicious of how few female singers we were listening to. And she goes now, this woman generally wrote hits for other singers. So think about who you'd rather hear singing these songs. In my face. Yeah, like, that's you're horrible. You're supposed to be a woman. You're supposed to understand that Carol. King, we want to hear the maternal quality of Carol King's voice. I have not you know, recovered from how evil that comment was. You know what, though? Like, this is something that goes back to high school for me, too. I remember, like, um, I was in, like, an AP American history class and it was like every day we'd come in and there'd be topics written on the board and every so often my teacher would write like a pop cultural item alongside whatever um whatever thing was going on but it was always very male i believe the british invasion was up there like beatles and then i think one day i walked into class and um madonna's name was on the board and i was always like oh my god is mr brown gonna slay today is like are we we gonna talk about like Madonna, are we going to get into it? And like, also in the back of my mind, I was like, how am I going to manage my homosexuality, which was very vivid inside me, but very hidden from the world. Oh my and God. I was like, this, this is like this a full is, poem. Wow. Yeah. This is a major personal challenge today. And then all we talked about, which, you know, I'm not averse to talking about it, but all we talked about was like, you know, the controversial nature of like a prayer. She, I was like, you know, there's a lot more here. I was, I was like, there's, there's, but I think he wanted to talk about it in terms of like cultural context, but she was very reduced in my AP American history course to, um, you know, the black Jesus of it all and oh uh, the sexuality of it all. No blonde ambition, no bedtime stories. Children aren't educated. It's a shame. No, I think I think he still teaches at that school, too. And I don't think he even knows what bedtime stories is. So some history teacher. I want to walk in like the cat in the hat to um, elementary schools and just uh, rant about forgotten Madonna eras. Like she was once a children's book author. In a very real way, if there's going to be someone to teach a college course about Madonna history, I do think it's you. And you know what? If Taylor Swift has college courses, why shouldn't Madonna? I'm sure she does. Can I Do say you know something this? about the Taylor Swift college courses? What is going I'm on? I'm sure you now? will. What? What could what is there to learn about Taylor Swift? It, like her her career is like a third of the way through what it will be. We're not at the point where you can have like a, you know what? I guess if you have Beatles studies, that's just 7 years of their lives. So maybe well, I'm actually, maybe I'm sexist. I- uh, maybe you're sexist, and also you, you don't understand this, but like they've actually renamed economy courses Taylor Swift courses oh. because of her because of her saving <laughs> come, of the U.S. economy. You come from academia, so you know that, right? <laughs> yeah, Thank NYU, you so much. T- NYU Tisch Dramatic Writing 2012. Oh God, they <laughs> understand finances all the time. Yes, one hundred percent diagonally. My favorite joke about NYU is Bowen Bowen Yang calls it um, a celebrity daycare. He called, um, there's some other uh, qualifiers there. It's like, it's essentially a real estate firm nowadays. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's not gotten better. Once upon a time, I was obsessed with getting into DePaul Theater in high school, which was like the big, like Midwestern. I guess you could go to Northwestern too. But um, now I think of that as just drop off the 38 grand and, you know, hope you become Judy Greer, one of the few graduates from that school I remember. I think Terrell Alvin McCraney went there too. So you can be rad and go there too. Oh, wow. I mean, yeah, it's uh, NYU boasts quite a roster of of graduates, but it's um, it's kind of uh, it's kind of shocking when I look back at like when I when I graduated from there, just how many people I think about 90 percent of the people I went to Tisch with, like no longer do this at all. And of of the 10 percent who are still pursuing like careers in the arts, I think five percent of them like you know, ha- had like agents from when they were children or have the last name like mm. Qua- Quaid. You know what I mean? <laughs> wow. Was one of the Quaids with you? Hopefully not Randy. 
I was friends with Jack Quaid in uh, college because we were in the same sketch comedy group together. And I and this oh connects to the Oppenheimer discussion. It was certainly a jump scare when he was in the film because Meg Ryan and Dennis Quaid's son Jack is in Oppenheimer and he was my buddy in college. But I remember it was one of those things where it was like, we're doing the auditions for the sketch group and I was the director at the time. And we see the, on the list, like, Jack Quaid. And we're like thinking, okay, now we're gonna have to either pretend that this this person is funny and talented or like, you know, you know, Melissa Rivers this situation. In some way. What are we gonna do with you? Yeah. And then he came in and was so funny and so talented and so good. So he kind of like made a huge case for nepotism right there. So what I'm saying is leave them alone. I have to say, many of my favorite celebrities deeply I mean, Jane Fonda, Angelica Houston, Anthony Perkins, like they all had famous parents. So Can I ask you, what's your take on Maya Hawk? I'm looking forward to more. I think she will provide I am a big Ethan Hawk fan. Um Uma less so. But uh Maya uh I'm I'm ha- I'm excited for her. What do you think? Well I actually think out of all out of all the nepos, and I'm taking you know any anyone I'm friends with out of this, but like out of all the nepos that are like like hard nepos, like no way around it. I'm gonna call them two parent nepos. Um, she to me, I think, is the one where I'm like, I can see a lot of both her parents in her, and I think that the, it's just like one of those cases where I'm like, oh, maybe star quality could be inherited because I find her really interesting oh that's how i feel about Um, dakota johnson you know it's just like it's all right there and it's both parents and also it's that like um carrie fisher debbie reynolds thing where it's like you don't really remind me of your mom but then like 10 beats in kind of like oh there's like a a sense of humor or something that's slightly reminiscent of your mom anyway we should be moving on this is just the introduction i understand you've podcasted before you've proven your point Um, i i I guess i i'll reserve my my comments on what i would consider uh dakota's shared slyness with her mother for later oh thank you for that that was so um lyrical of you (laughs) it was elegant of me yes yes um so we have matt rogers with us today we also have with us today the fabulous shea coulee uh Mm -hmm. drag race legend musician which we'll get into Shea Coulee is also from Chicago, so we know she has a soul. But because because of the cultural moment, Matt and I will be getting into Barbie, which we both saw, Oppenheimer, which we both saw, and we will also unpack famous dual movie releases in history, a la Barbie and Oppenheimer, and pick a winner from each of these duels. Uh, you'll be surprised. There's not many on the level of Barbie and Oppenheimer. I kind of thought we would run into more like blockbuster v. blockbuster Kramer versus Kramer situations, but um, it will be fun to um, pick favorites and and least favorites, as you know, because this is a negative podcast. Part of my like hesitance to like commit to the whole like Barbenheimer thing is because I was like assuming that this happens all the time. I'm like, oh, two movies came out on the same day and they're different. Like this probably has to have happened a million times. Like what is with this phenomenon? I kind of felt like, oh, this is meme culture. Like really taking off with um with all of our brains at the same time but then i guess i was kind of surprised to find that this hasn't happened that many times no and also the ph- phenomenon is just that barbie is pink and oppenheimer is brown it's truly like do you like crayola we have two of the c- crayons in the box at the movie it's giving it's giving binary in a, binary in a way that i'm uncomfortable with right um, no. we're but, gonna but unpack fully it. participated in <laughs> That's true. Right. Likewise. Likewise. We will be right back after this. Like Santa Claus and Krampus, the diametric double act of Barbie and Oppenheimer arrived this weekend, flooding theaters in a sea of pink and brown. Barbie was the clear box office winner, but honestly, Oppenheimer, no slouch. Let's get into Barbie first. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing. Um, You can listen to a discussion about Barbie on a million different podcasts. Unfortunately, you have run into one of the few podcasts where the host totally did not get this movie i did not enjoy barbie i thought there were a couple of funny lines i thought it ended with a tremendous joke that was very new yorker cartoon worthy i thought uh margot robbie was fantastic ryan gosling gave a familiar kind of lonely island faux machismo performance that we've seen before amused by that otherwise 
I, I was just tired out by the relationship between the Barbie world and the real world. I just wanted it to stay in Barbie world. What did you think of this movie, man? Okay, so when I last saw you, it was at a gathering of many queers, and uh, there were many different opinions on this. And I think I came in, uh, I you know, the last time it's taken me this long for my opinion to sort of form about a movie is weirdly Tar. I remember leaving Tar and feeling like I didn't get that. And then about 48 hours later, I realized it was the only relevant of an art I maybe had ever seen. Tar is one of the hardest sets. You really have to be like, I I was concussed with this movie and now I'm not sure, yes. And I would actually say that it's not dissimilar here because what I really appreciate about this movie Barbie, which now I, in retrospect, I quite liked, is that it is so fucking full of ideas. And I think that that is what made me, when I was leaving the movie, be like, yeah, I had fun every single second I was watching that movie, but I don't think it worked. And then I actually will give credit to one of the queers at that gathering we were at, Joel Kim Booster, who said this in a way that I understood and now can sort of frame the movie through this, which is the movie was written through play logic. And so I think that when you think about it like that, and when you think about it like, you know, this movie is written as if we're actually picking up the dolls and letting our imaginations run wild, it kind of feels a little silly to me to be the person I was leaving that movie and be like, well, logically, that, 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 because you remember the movie is called Barbie. Right. And um, the whiz so bang I'm, is part of the play logic, yes. Correct. And so I guess where I sit with it right now is, as a, you know, as someone who like looks for these things to make sense and like wanted this to, I guess, hit in a certain way that was like, you know, just as um, philosophically uh, stimulating as I think it wants to be or just as fun, you know, it's like maybe not hitting every single box, but I can't say I didn't fucking enjoy every single moment of watching this outside of like, do I think it worked structurally maybe not but if anyone's going to break this form it probably should be Greta Gerwig and Noah Baumbach I think the deal is there are a ton of ideas even about what the movie is like like the movie keeps jumping around in terms of like first of all you think it's just Barbie relating to other Barbies and then Ken and then it introduces this portal into the real world that involves um somebody writing ideas for a Barbie played by America Ferreira. And then it gets into her relationship with her daughter. I found that to be a little just uninteresting. I thought America Ferreira was working hard to make that character interesting, but it felt shoehorned in. I, another friend of ours said it felt like that was from a draft, a different draft of the movie. Um, and I think I liked the movie best when it felt like the Brady Bunch movie to me, when it felt like here's Barbie and she's from this, crazy planet where everybody has a symmetrical face and everybody's happy all the time. And she thuds with reality in purely comic ways. I think it wanted to have also a serious relationship with reality, which I found it, it didn't produce any dividends for me. I, again, it's, it, uh, there were several like comments in the movie about what Barbie has, how damaging Barbie has been. And I thought that was so like, it was going for a feminist angle, and I found it just self-conscious about the fact that we like Barbies. I was saying, I don't think in the G.I. Joe movie there's a sidebar about the military-industrial complex. You know what I mean? We're just enjoying the G.I. Joes. And I wish it could have just kind of coasted on bliss a little bit more, you know? Yeah, I hear that. I think that that's what makes it a Greta Gerwig thing, is that right. I think— It's I an ambitious choice, Yeah. Right, I think that there probably were many versions of this movie before. In fact, in my like research of it and just general awareness of there going to be a Barbie movie, which I think was back like 10 years, back to the- Several different people were uh, like Diablo Schumer. Cody was supposed to write it. Amy Schumer was supposed to be a part of it, correct, yeah. I believe there was a version with Anne Hathaway and like I saw an interview with Amy Schumer and they asked her about why it didn't work out with Barbie. It might've even been Watch What Happens Live and Amy basically said like, she didn't want to do a girl boss Barbie. And it basically was like, sh everyone was sort of looking for the version of this that could be subversive enough to be interesting and also entertaining enough to justify the fact that we are doing the Barbie movie. And especially now, like if we're going to spend the amount of money that um, we're spending on it, we want it to be, you know, monoculture enough and exciting enough and accessible enough for everyone. And so I think that what we ultimately have is something that is pretty challenging because of like 
the amount of things it asks you to accept. Like the third act of the movie really becomes just like surrealist philosophy, anything goes. Like we sort of lose the plot a little bit in a way that again, I think justifies itself with the play logic of it all. But there is certainly the risk you run of like someone just not getting it anymore, which I which I think is like my thing with a lot of Marvel movies is it's just like, this is a Marvel movie, why don't I get it? You know what I'm saying? It's like, whereas at the end of the Barbie movie, I think when you just throw your cares to the wind a little bit more, you can appreciate it. And ultimately I turned to my friends during this movie and I said, this is fucking insane about 10 times. And I think amount, around, around time six or seven, you should get that that's maybe the point. Um, that being said, could we have had a movie that took place entirely in Barbie world and it would have been a little bit clearer? Yes. Could we have had a movie that's just, you know, Barbie getting sucked up out of Barbie world and being placed in the real world and having that be the engine of the plot? Yes. I think these things could have been more straightforward, but I just think like, while while I think that there will be people who take issue with it for this reason, I think Greta and Noah are too interesting to do something that straightforward with something that seems straightforward. You know what I mean? I think that would have been boring for them. I think given the fact that they wrote this movie and of, of course it was going to be more interesting and convoluted and I don't know, literary than the average Barbie movie. I still am surprised though, the feminism angle that it goes for very directly in this latter half of the movie, like uh, America Ferreira gives this speech where about what, how women are supposed to be. Like you have to be, you know, like a mother, but not like this, a mother in this not naggy, like the, yeah. Yes. And goes into the contradictions of what is expected of women. I thought that was very, been done and also reminded me of like sketches about feminism you would see on like a failed logo network sketch show from the 2000s or something it just felt very like not this moment it felt like 10 or 15 years old in a way that surprised me because i felt like they would update that sketch and also be a little bit harder on men like women are supposed to be no 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 it's that men expect women to be like talk di directly about how men are doing this to women you know it just felt like this like kind of gaslighty speech about how th there's vague expectations out there for women in the world and like no 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 like be direct about who is doing this to women i just thought it could, that message could have been stronger ultimately i think that um that is where the movie has a really tall task actually because while i agree in watching that monologue it felt a little 2018 to me um and maybe to a lot of people that um we're seeing this in like areas where we've had this conversation i think there's also a knowledge of the fact that had that monologue or had that moment or had those themes been really challenging and I guess like, you know. Uh, right, some, you'd be getting away from a Barbie movie, I guess, you know. You but. would, and also I think there's an acknowledgement of the fact that this, by nature of being the Barbie movie starring Margot Robbie and Ryan Gosling and like marketed as aggressively as it is, one of the only tent pulls we may even have this year, like it's it's, getting to a point where it's like this is monoculture before it even starts to be written and so i think there is that idea that like having a monologue that is as like maybe to us a little bit been done or a little bit broad is like really new for a lot of people who may be seeing this movie who quite frankly um will be really challenged by this when you put it against other studio fare or other big movies that you're asked to see. I mean, pretty much the last like four or five big studio movies that are like mass appeal have also been the dumbest movies I've seen in years. I mean, Fast X, you could be a toddler and be like, I actually think we could have done this and maybe it would have been a better idea that's me watching Fast X as a toddler, by the way. Yeah. Right. And I mean, like, I, my brain essentially, like, commits to what it truly is, which is a toddler brain when I'm in. That's why I can't see them anymore. I, I, I don't think I can see the, the last Mission Impossible. I think it will just be the, the final death knell on my on my IQ. I'm surprised you didn't see no, it. No, no, no. I did see it. Oh, I just yeah, can't yeah. see the last one. Because remember, just like Fast X, it's, like, essentially, like, both these movies are the penultimate movies. Oh, and, I see. And, and yes. they're things which, you know, removes all stakes, et cetera. But who's... who's who's right. knocking those movies. I just think like 
this movie is way more challenging and way more like thick in terms of the themes than like pretty much what the general um, movie going public is being asked to consume. And I think if anything was going to be broad and feel like it want, needed to be spoon fed to the audience, like at least it was that monologue, which is like sort of, I guess, one of the major points of the movie is it's like even Barbie an ideal feels overwhelmed and traumatized by the male gaze when she realizes it. And another thing I really liked about this movie was, um, you know, actually the the con confrontation of Barbie as a fascist by, by those like I young girls. I enjoyed that one line. I do think the money, the movie needed more funny lines. Like, just did you not think it was funny? Every once in a while, I thought the performances were good. I enjoyed Issa Rae's uh, small performance. Uh, there were there were several people who I thought did a good job. But um, they were just sort of like blips in the movie, you know, whereas I, I didn't like Will Ferrell. I thought that was a warmed over performance he could have given in 2002. I did not understand the Rhea Perlman sidebar where she was the creator of Barbie coming in. That to was say, weird. What? For me. What the yeah. fuck? That was, was weird for I'm me. I'm the creator of Barbie <laughs> and I'm in this movie and I'm dead. And I'm also going to give you Wikipedia facts about myself. And also this has nothing to do with the rest of the movie. I just like, why? And she's a ghost. And yes, you find right. out she's a ghost who rents an apartment there. See, that's when I was just like, oh, okay. It's a, it, my bad for for taking this uh, as as liter literally and seriously as I was. At no, that put point, on your zany like, goggles. Oh. Yeah, right. Yeah. And, and you know, that's something I do like to do. I do like to put on the zany goggles. There's like a expectation and like the, the, it's grounded in one thing and then for it uh, as a barbie movie to like constantly keep rewriting the the rules of the movie is both a little frustrating and also kind of impressive in a way where i'm like okay i'm kind of like uh not mad at this movie for no longer quote unquote making sense because again you leave the movie and you're like Am I am I like ripping apart the seams of the script of the Barbie movie? You know what I mean? That that being said, I do think there is versions of this that could have been easier. Yeah, right. And also maybe in the future when we get the inevitable Ken movie or Skipper movie or something, it'll stay more in Barbie land since we've I mean, like they really explored, I think, all the themes you can in terms of the world's relationship to Barbie. You know what I mean? So maybe in the future it would stay more. Um, be a more so cohesive one world uh, film. I'm trying to think of uh, other people in the movie who who got big moments. I was surprised like Emerald Fennell is in it for like one minute. I think the weird thing about this movie is we were so pimped out on the guest star, guest star component. And then really, aside from Margot Robbie and Ryan Gosling, nobody really gets a hell of a lot to do. You know, it's like maybe like four lines, like even like Issa Rae might be the most featured other cast member. And I would say she has one or two big moments. Yeah, I would also say um, I don't think Issa Rae was served by the dance numbers. Um. I, oh, there is. OK, there's a dance number at the beginning of this movie, which was it, it, they have a funny joke about how she's uh, Barbie has asked what she's doing tonight. She's like, oh, I'm over at the dream house dancing to a bespoke song, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then they go into this dance number and. It doesn't feel like anybody involved maybe has ever danced before. It felt like a lot of panning around people who are about to dance. And yeah. Interesting choice. Uh, I felt like we could have had more dancers in there. I will say, like, who really held the center of that and the, this whole movie. And I, do, I, I think that it's kind of funny because, like, in the conversation of Barbie, who's weirdly getting lost the most is Margot. Yes. Because right. she's so... I think so... also things happen to her in this movie. Even though I think she's fat, I think she's the best thing about the movie. Yeah, she's a little inactive as a protagonist, which is which is which is odd. And I would say that she has a little bit of a thankless role ultimately because she's actually the grounding force, and that's interesting because she's also Barbie. I think that it would have been nice to see her get some more comedic set pieces. I think the obviously lion share of those did go to Ryan as Ken. But what I want to compliment her on is that. You know, when you hear Margot Robbie is cast as Barbie, you kind of are just like, yeah, of course. But there, in that, yeah, of course, like you have to accept so much about the reality of what she's doing. And she makes it look incredibly easy to just hold the center of this Barbie movie. And that is a task for movie stars only. And what I think is really frustrating about a lot of the critical response to this movie 
is I've seen many times in, in certain reviews like this, this idea. Wow, Margot Robbie has really proven she has what it takes to be a movie star. And it's like, what are you talking about? Like, where have you been? Like, it's been clear a decade at least of her, like, I mean, her breakout role was a movie star making role, uh, like uh, opposite Leonardo DiCaprio and The Wolf of Wall Street. And I just feel like there is this um, taking for granted of what she's um, right for and capable of in this movie and just how involved she was in the creation of this movie that I think needs to be looked at because, you know, I, I just don't think, and we've heard the names of the other people that were attached, I don't think anyone could have done this as well or as... Um, seamlessly as Margot Robbie because she holds the frame of the Barbie movie throughout and that's never in doubt. I think also what she plays really well aside from just looking like a Barbie and doing the physical comedy of being Barbie really well like mm-hmm. when she's like sits on the floor and falls down you know yeah. the, the things you expect from a Barbie movie the whole the thing she do, uh, exhibits really well is the the verging on conscious uh, consciousness you know just like Oh, I'm coming into these thoughts. Oh, I'm thinking these things for the first time. I'm wondering about the world I'm in. And that's a really relatable quality. Like she re- she lends a relatableness to this movie that I don't think many other people would pull off. Again, which is difficult when you look like her. When you look like her in our Barbie and yet you're an audience surrogate, like that's an incredibly tough walk. Did you think, by the way, so Helen Mirren is the narrator of this movie, which felt a little first thought for me, but even though she did a good job, there's a part in this movie where Helen Mirren says, after Margot Robbie is giving a speech about how women are supposed to look or something, she comes in with a vocal note and says, "Uh, dear the producers of this movie, uh, this is a hard point to make when you cast Margot Robbie as Barbie. I felt like that was both kind of funny and that it was unexpected and also not really serving Margot Robbie. I thought it like took me out of it. I, I know obviously the movie is meta in a hundred thousand ways, but it was almost like it was cutting down her performance to me in a way. She was doing a great job. I didn't have to question it. I mean, I think it was solely about her looks, which the movie is obviously very aware of because she's literally walking around playing Barbie and looking like Margot Robbie. I laughed. I mean, at that point, I think it may have even been at that point in the movie where I was like, Wait, okay. I'm just gonna. I'm really gonna put down, put down my my glasses on this one and put on my wacko goggles because that was when I was like, okay, we're really committing to a completely different thing here. And I also think weirdly with that type of line and like another one of my favorite lines in the movie is um, Kate McKinnon as weird Bar- Barbie she holding did a the great Birkenstock. Job. She did a great job. She yes. was great She's holding the Birkenstock and the heel and being like, you have to choose. And Margot's like, oh, I choose the heel. And then Kate McKinnon says, no, you have to want to know. It was just sort of like this fun way for these people who are obviously like masters of structure in terms of screenplay to be like poking fun at the idea that like, you know, you have this character that wants to live in bliss and perennial happiness and Barbie world. But like they do also have to be the protagonist of this movie. movie. Yes. Yeah, exactly. I, I thought that was fun. And there's, I think, a younger version of me that's like maybe studying screenwriting or, you know, um, just getting to know uh, my own taste in terms of movies that I think really likes that. And I think what I have to, and maybe what, you know, creative people, I guess, have to like think about when being critical about this movie is it's like, we're ahead of this because like we study this thing. And you know what I mean? Like for everyone else though, I think that might just be fun. Right, right, right. Um, I, I will say also in general, I saw a video with Greta Gerwig talking about the like classic film influences that went into Barbie, and she goes through literally 30 movies, and she does it comprehensively. She is no slouch when it comes to film history, and of course, we would all suspect she knows this stuff really well. But uh, she brought up The Wizard of Oz, and of course, uh, and Singing in the Rain in this same context where she uh, said that she wanted to build these visual worlds that were clearly artificial, but there was still soul in them. I'm thinking about specifically in Singing in the Rain when there's the big Sid Cherise dance number at the end. You're in this incredible place that is clearly a studio, but there's a majesty to the fact that it's all so quote unquote fake looking. And I really think that's the best thing about this movie. The visual world really takes you away in a way that is satisfying that you really want um, out of a Barbie movie. And I think also uh, on the Wizard of Oz tip, it's like a reverse Wizard of Oz and that this person starts out in the fantasy world and is introduced to the concept of reality and has to learn how to want that and 
uh, and desire the the complexity of the real world. And I think that's an interesting idea. And it didn't have enough concrete ideas about reality to make that pay off. So that I think is ultimately my um, my biggest problem with the movie. And also, of course, that I, I just have already seen that Will Ferrell performance before. Please cast somebody else. Chris, have Christoph Waltz do that performance. I don't know. I would agree that um, it felt like a leap to really believe that Barbie would want the real world. Yes, I think that's also it too. Like, I don't think they did the full job of convincing us there's something in the real world for for Barbie. Even like, if the if the movie had ended the way this movie ends, where she goes um, into this o- real life office building, and then I'm going to spoil the line, but she goes, "I'm going to go visit my gynecologist." If that was her first entry for real into the real world, I think that would have been satisfying. You know. Then you would have gotten deleted a huge chunk of this movie, but yeah, I agree with you. I mean, like, I I think that there's probably, you know, six or seven versions of this movie that could have worked, but I have to say, I'm happy we arrived at this version because it was interesting, it was different, and I would say that it is probably the only film. Outside of maybe something else the next director we're going to discuss directed um, that I've been like really surprised on a take on something really well known. Like I, I was I was constantly like befuddled by the choices. And I think that's ultimately interesting. And I did think it was funny and laughed a lot. So give me a million of these before you give me the next movie. Got it. Um, no, I, I also just want to say the anticipation for this movie, like I did not want to hear not only any spoilers, I didn't even want to hear thumbs up or thumbs down takes from my own friends. So I just mm-hmm. want to say if we can whip up a frenzy just about the nature of a movie and how we know we're about to get something gonzo and daffy, but we don't know what or what direction it's going to go in. That is so thrilling. So I'm very happy for this movie and its success. And I hope, you know, the next one's just a little bit better. That's all. <laughs> And the uh, second item up for bids today is Oppenheimer, directed by noted male Christopher Nolan. It's never Uh, been more obvious. (laughs) Yes. I I will say going into this movie, there was also an anticipation for me in that the star is not overexposed to prestige. So I didn't really know why you would cast Killian Murphy to play Oppenheimer. Uh, My first insight into that is they really uh, made a meal out of close-ups on this man's face, and he really has an interesting face. So if you're looking for like poetic regret, if you're looking for surprise, if you're looking for snarkiness, I mean, he's got these like IMAX size eyes where it all resonates. So there's a lot to watch there. That said, like Barbie, I felt like this was a mishmash of movie styles, but at least unlike Barbie to me, it presented those styles in sequence. You got like one movie, the first hour, a different one, the second hour, a different one, the third hour. I will now break those down. The first one, I felt was the the weakest part of the movie, which was it was so montagey. It felt like an endless previously on Mad Men thing, where music is constantly playing, every moment was urgent, and yet everything was just a conversation. Also, I felt like he couldn't pick his moments in terms of what was supposed to quote unquote matter, and I was exhausted with the film pretty immediately as Oppenheimer, and uh, all these uh, other other people are giving. Um, trial of the chicago seven like performances where like my hands on a desk and i'm screaming now uh robert downey jr looking very david strathairn in this movie with a little bit of stanley tucci um is the kind of most prominent uh supporting player in this movie and he becomes more interesting uh as the film goes on but anyway the second part of the movie is when we get the explosions and it turns into you know the uh billion dollar fiasco we all expect it to look like and then the third part of the movie where people are testifying for and against Oppenheimer felt to me like a play from 1958, you know, like, um, like a 12 angry men style. Um, Oppenheimer's good in this way. He's bad in this way. And also this movie qualifies, even though Florence Pugh was in the first hour, when she leaves, then Emily Blunt comes in. So I think this technically counts as what I call a TOWASC movie, T O W A S C, which stands for there's one woman and she's concerned. Um, which is my least favorite kind of movie. But um, I will say it was when we got to the explosive part of the movie, I thought it was entertaining. But otherwise, it starts as an 
a very familiar kind of biopic. It, it feels to me like like an imitation game or a Darkest Hour or something like that. And literally the Darkest Hour. If this movie could have been filmed in an Abercrombie and Fitch, it was so dark. Um, uh, I think this movie was okay and weakened by the fact that it's too long and also not deep enough. Um, at, at, at the end of this movie, it's like, yep, he was part of this giant, very destructive force. And now he kind of feels bad about it. That's it. What did you think of this movie? Wikipedia textbook, the film. Um, uh-huh. Unfortunately, I was already gone uh, an hour Both and Kelly a half Clarkson. in. I, I was, yeah, I mean, and <laughs> I would have, just the, the three and a half minutes of that song, I get more um, sort of like surprising emotional <laughs> conflict than what I got here. I have to say, uh, I would have been bored to tears, but I was also so dehydrated with boredom that I had to keep the moisture in my body or I wouldn't have survived. Well, you were near death. Wow. It was uncomfortable for me to sit there. Um, And also, I'll be honest, I'll be one of those people that says this, and this is annoying, and I I hate hearing this, but... I could not hear this movie. Um, I, I paid for a good experience in, to, in this movie. This is the second time that I've experienced that phenomenon with a Christopher Nolan movie. I also had this problem with Interstellar, a movie that I'm an apologist for. I'm, I'm actually historically a huge fan of Christopher Nolan's movies. I think I like Inception more than most. I actually consider it an art film and not just like a big popular blockbuster movie. I don't think I knew this about you. I'm surprised. I love Inception. I, I loved its Oscar win. I absolutely love The Dark Knight. It's one of my favorite movies. I think The Dark Knight Rises is nearly as good as that. And I'm a big Christopher Nolan fan. I just feel this is the first movie I've seen from him in quite some time. And I'm upset and a little like disturbed by his lack of forward motion in terms of like, yes, how he writes female characters. I don't understand Florence Pugh's constant nudity in this film. I don't understand the weird um, like uh, dream sequence that Emily Blunt has in that one scene in the interrogation room where she sees Florence Pugh fucking him. I couldn't get out of my mind how uncomfortable and weird that must have been for her to film. The Casey Affleck thing was a jump scare for me. I just, there were, there were so many, it was all just odd. And um, I wasn't entertained enough to not be distracted by those things. Um, I would also say that while I think the movie gets more interesting as it goes, like I think it could have just been the last act of that movie. Definitely. I don't think we, I don't think we need it. While I think like yes, of course, explosions are entertaining, one hundred percent. I just feel like it took us so long to get there. The Barbie movie was over by the time the atom bombs are dropped in Oppenheimer. And the thing is just like, I was way more interested in that character study and like the like moral dilemma of all the characters. But then it felt like for a movie that was that long, that part of it was like weirdly stuffed at the end. Right. I will say Barbie, I think, is a deeper movie than Oppenheimer, for sure. I think that's Oh, I would true. agree 100%. And it's just so funny that that's obviously not going to be the public perception from the outside. But then when you see them, like, one movie is just way more interesting. And I, I would just say, like, uh, for for someone that I think would identify as, like, not only a storyteller but a craftsman, I think he's got craft issues. I fully, in- I fully intend to see this movie win tons of Oscars, um, you know, in the craft categories. But I'm like... Is that just because it's Christopher Nolan? Is that just because we're supposed to give him like those types of awards and, it's a and box recognition? Office success. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just feel like for the first time in a really long time, so far away from what the public and critical reception of this movie has been, in a way that like makes me feel like bad, but I know this movie isn't good. <laughs> Well, you know what's weird is like watching the movie. I felt like th- there were um, engrossing moments for me, suspenseful moments for me. But then looking back, it all feels l- like a conventional movie to me. You know, I just like I can't really name the, the X factor it has that would warrant the amount of Oscars we're now expecting it to win. It's tricks. It's editing tricks. It's anyone can do this. It's like incredibly fast cuts to create suspense. Like it's just like it's like anyone 
in like a cinema studies course, like could watch a scene from this movie and really get how to build tension because it's so on the nose. You know what I mean? There's nothing new or interesting about it. I would have loved to have seen a performance from an actor in the first two hours, um, but he doesn't trust his actors enough to do that. Everything is a huge, 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 like cut to something else, random explosion here. The score is laughable. I have to it say, the so score is extremely oppressive. In, 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 in the first hour, which I said felt like a montage, specifically, it reminds me of a movie like Evita, and I've brought this up before, mm -hmm. where it's hard to criticize Madonna's performance because you don't really get a performance. It's so smash cut together, you know? And it, in this movie, it's like, until the last part where everybody gets this moment to, you know, speak their piece about Oppenheimer, that's when, like, the acting begins and like Emily Blunt's character is not just uh, a drunk woman in the corner of the screen anymore. Then she gets a moment. I do wonder if we're going to get the first Emily Blunt supporting actress nomination here, even though it's just not that fascinating a role. You know, she yeah, really I mean... is just like the woman in the movie who um, is, is his conscience sometimes, you know, like in the way that the, the woman who's concerned in the movie is supposed to be. Yeah. I mean, I think that, well, it's it's her 12th or 13th most interesting performance for me. I think if this is what gets her her first Oscar nomination, I'm happy we can call our Academy Award nominee Emily Blunt. But it's one of those like Rachel McAdams situations where it's like, really? Like, we're going to look at her resume and Spotlight is going to be the one that like right. we, uh -huh. we gave her a claim for. It's kind of just like it feels like it's time. And so dot, dot, dot. I would imagine we're going to get that for Robert Downey Jr. too in what was really a David Strathairn performance and. I just, I guess I just had questions about why we're casting Robert Downey Jr. in this part. It was like, did we want to just spend more money on prosthetics? Like it was like, well, we have the budget. We can pay Robert Downey Jr. So let's cast him in this role. He's like not really appropriate for, but like sure capable of. Just so many little things like that that just took me out of it in a way where I was just like, you know, the movie was so asking you to buy in, buy in, buy in. Whereas like the Barbie movie was asking you like, have fun, have fun, have fun. And yet the weird, the casting in Oppenheimer felt more stunty to me. I also wonder what you said about like the sound issues in this movie, if that has something to do with the different kinds of theaters you can experience this in. Like I, 100%. Like, in, in my theater, like I couldn't really hear uh, over the score, like the dialogue in the first couple scenes, but then it basically cleared up for me. I wonder if like maybe IMAX was worse than, I don't know, Dolby or Laser or whatever. I, I, I want people to, I'm sure there are people out there who've seen them in all these formats. And I'm just curious because certain people really had a hard time hearing this movie. Whereas like I generally found the dialogue clear enough. I mean, it's like, <sighs> I've heard it so many times and I, so it's it's like hard for me to even say that because I remember feeling like that about Interstellar and really struggling the whole time but then if you watch his other movies like there is this really odd thing he has where the score and and the editing and what is going on really covers the screenplay. It really covers the action. And I think that it's like short, interesting and helps everything move forward directorially. But I guess like, I just wish he would get out of the way of his movies a little bit more. Like, and I think he does that by the end. And then you get, I think the good part of the movie, but I, I can't help, but at the end of a three hour movie nowadays, feeling like sad about the first two hours of my experience. You know what I'm saying? It's just like, God, it like it really took a long time to get to a part that was compelling. And I just wonder if it's like, I, I, I would be actually really interested to see a Christopher Nolan movie that didn't utilize his crutches. And I think we get there, but the whole first couple hours was just so like, it almost felt imitation Nolan in a way where it's just like, I don't think this is a progression for him at all. And people calling it his best, I don't yeah, understand that. I definitely don't agree with that. And also, I think even though 
it's we're talking about a series of two hours that lead up into the part that feels the most dramatic. It felt like the movie was impatient, too. It was like jumping so fast between like dialogue scenes and introducing characters who are, you know, interchangeable. You know, I say everybody, every man in this movie looks like a villain in Hidden Figures. You know, like we all have glasses and, um, you know, that's you can't be doing math out here, woman, like that kind of energy. I also thought the like choice of black and white and color like that was like a little unclear to be honest with you I, I understand what it was but I'm just like I don't know like there just was I, I'm I'm really far away from like the the critical reception on this movie and I have to wonder if the if people actually like this movie as much as they say I really and I've thought that many times this year and I don't want to necessarily like come for certain movies but I've seen some things and I look at their Rotten Tomato scores and I'm like do we feel indebted to people that are making movies now? Is that is our industry in such a bad place that we feel bad for chasing things out of theaters? Do we feel like we have to support certain things? I'm just like, I just don't understand watching this movie and being like, that was one of the best films of the decade, which people are already saying. Yeah, like, we'll have to sidebar I've, about I, the certain movies you're talking about because I, I am uh, uh, curious about that. But uh, you know what I will say? I do think I will rewatch both of these movies because I feel like I'm so not in the middle of the Metacritic um, bubble where everybody else is on these. And I want to understand where other people, I, I like people ultimately, and mm -hmm. I want to be like them. I so, want to understand them. <laughs> yes, right. You're and like believe, Barbie. Okay, so that's all for Barbie. That's all for Oppenheimer for now. We are going to talk next to hopefully our new friend, Shea Coulee. Keep It is brought to you by Green Chef. Green Chef is the number one meal kit for eating clean. Feel your best with nutritionist-approved recipes packed with green ingredients and clean ingredients that support your healthy lifestyle and taste great, too. I actually have a poor lifestyle, um, to be honest, which is why I like to eat healthy so I can balance things out. Eating well doesn't have to be boring. You can satisfy your cravings for adventurous eats made nutritious. Discover exciting new flavors this summer with recipes that feature certified organic fruits and vegetables, sustainably sourced seafood, and unique farm fresh ingredients like tart cherries, truffle zest, and rainbow cards. Green Chef is the only meal kit that is both carbon and plastic offset. They offset 100% of their delivery emissions as well as 100% of the plastic in every box. Plus, nearly all packaging materials are curbside recyclable in most areas in the U.S. With Green Chef, you're reducing your food waste by up to 23% with grocery shopping. So Green Chef even offers 10-minute nutritious lunches, perfect for when you're on the go or pressed for time at the office. Let me tell you something. It's summer, and I love a picnic. I love taking a basket to grandmother's house and, you know, avoiding wolves, big bad wolves along the way. That's my idea of a picnic. Get into it, and you can use Green Chef to help you with whatever basket you're bringing to grandmother's house. So just go to greenchef.com slash keepit50 and use code keepit50 to get 50% off plus free shipping. That's greenchef.com slash keepit50 and code keepit50 to get 50% off plus free shipping. And when I say keepit50, I mean 50, the number, like, like Hawaii. Get it? Hawaii 50. Anyway, greenchef.com slash keepit50 and code keepit50 to get 50% off plus free shipping. Our guest today is a queen amongst queens. She's the winner of RuPaul All-Stars 5, an icon, a musician, whose debut album, Eight, is out now. And I love this album. It's it's a chill, mellow, sexy, I, I want to put it on near a pool sort of album. We are thrilled to welcome to keep it the stunning and vivacious Shea Coulee. And before you say anything, Shea Coulee, I just want to say you came on uh, the Zoom and you said you're experiencing withdrawal symptoms post the Renaissance tour and I want you to go into that right now and just tell us the depression, what's happening with you. Yes. Uh, first of all, hey, girl, hey. Hey. Um, uh, yeah. Today is, I always like try and keep it 100, you know. And honestly, today is not a good day. Um, <laughs> because it is now day three post the Renaissance World Tour. And I feel like the come down after such a 
um, otherworldly religious experience is really hard. Like, no joke, I went to the tour. First of all, I was not even I was not even playing around with these seats. Okay, like speaking of winning RuPaul's Drag Race All Stars Five, I took part of my winnings and I opened up a savings account to put money away just so I could go and see Beyonce and have <laughs> like a full VIP experience. So that money was sitting in the account for three years appreciating waiting for the moment for me to get these tickets and i said honey i'm gonna get pure honey i'm gonna be on the stage so that beyonce can see me which she did she blew me a kiss it was amazing also i saw the video you took it looked like you were on a porch with beyonce i mean she was just basically next to you. we were just like what's up i could feel the fans like i could feel the like residual wind from Beyonce, like that's how close it was. And like, it, it just was incredible. The show was unbelievable. I cried, I screamed, I lost my voice. And then like the past like three days post that, I've been like realizing, I was like, oh my God. So like now that's like over. I saw it in London and I'm seeing it this Saturday again in uh, New Jersey slash New York and I'm, I, now that I know what to expect, I think I'm more excited. I think that's, yes. that's, that's <laughs> like when you when you really understand what she's doing up there and just how like technologically advanced it is and how like precise it all is and that it's every song you'd want to hear. Now I'm yes. more excited for my second time. Yes, yes. And also just like Beyonce fans are a lot of fun, you know, like. Mm -hmm no matter where you are, you're going to be surrounded by your best friends. Like everyone is in a good mood. Everyone's ready to party and dance yeah. and sing along and cry and hug each other. It's just great. Do it's you, really great. Can you pick, I mean, it seems unfair, but can you pick a peak moment from the tour? Okay. Um, it's probably quite unexpected, but it's really like right in the beginning when she's doing her ballads, mm -hmm. she came over she sat on the piano, like she was like right there. And when she started singing <laughs> one, plus one plus one, one, I don't know what even happened. The waterworks, like I was crying <laughs> so uncontrollably, <laughs> you know, like I'm beat. Thank God that I <laughs> use a really good setting spray. But like the, the tears are streaming and like, <laughs> I turn over and this like middle-aged auntie just like tapped my shoulder and she like handed me just like all these tissues because she saw me going through it and like all the other girls in the sex were like, oh. But really, I was, I, I just loved it. And she looked so amazing. She was in her beautiful scaparelli, this like black oh. gown with like all these white mm. feathers. The wind was perfect. It was just gorgeous. And she was really just like hitting those vocals and I just lost it. It was so good. How many drag queens are you likely to encounter at a Beyonce show? Were there, was, were there, were, were you amongst many queens? Oh my God. Uh, yeah. The girls were out um, in full force. Yeah. Uh, everybody was ready. Like now, I don't, I'm like trying to think. I'm like, now most of the girls, like the drag queens were there. Were they in drag? I don't know. A lot of girls were like, wow, Shay, I applaud you for like getting up like in the drags to go to the Beyonce concert. And I was just like, bitch, I knew that I was going, that she would see me. So I was uh -huh. like, I'm gonna look, everyone wants to look their best, right? I was like, I know how to do strategic, smart drag, be gorgeous yet comfortable and like, you know, able to see a Beyonce concert. So, you know, that's what I did. I had a whole day, got ready. It was, it was beautiful. I think for me, savage, savage was the moment. I th like when she co she comes out basically on a tank, Lewis. Tank. I mean, like oh it, it is, it, there, it, she's riding out on a tank, surrounded by greatness. It's just like, I mean, I mean, Taylor Swift has her red era. This was Beyonce's red era. Mm. This it's was it was it was a full on just like march forward i was like black parade was also at that moment when yeah. blue ivy was coming out by the way a lot of people are saying blue ivy isn't giving anything no she's an unbothered sleigh yeah absolutely i'm like um check her technique baby. <laughs> it's there like she is sharp she knows the ones the twos the one ands the two ands you know what i'm saying yep. like she she got it don't y'all even worry and if anyone is concerned let's all take you back to when you were 11 years old, throw you out yeah. there in front of like 20,000 people and see how you do. 100%. I think it is just super daunting to realize you've had the definitive concert experience of your life. I saw 
in 2011, Prince, with opening act Shaka Khan, and then Whitney Houston Ugh. came out as a surprise from the audience. And you know, like this is near wow. the end for Wendy. So Whitney, so it was up and down. But there were good moments. But then uh-huh. afterwards, I was like. I absolutely know there is no successor to that that will ever. And if you told me 10 years from now, oh, actually, only Shaka will be left. I mean, just it's like uh, impossible yeah. to think about, you know, <laughs> unbelievable. Anyway, I I, ra- I randomly saw um, this was I would say that the Renaissance World Tour was my favorite concert of all time. But I randomly saw her do four shows at Roseland Ballroom for her four album. This was I was probably 100 yards away. And I have to say, just like maybe the last time she ever did like an intimate show. Yeah. So uh-huh. to, to get in there right before it became what it became. I don't know. I don't, that that can... can't be beat. You can actually see the um, Roseland show on DVD playing yep. on my TV in the background of my season nine audition. That's how really? often I watched that. Yes, it is like literally, I'm doing my interview over it. It's on mute, but it's literally because I had this tiny, you know, my tiny little apartment. It's just like on the, the First of all, the TV was only a 22 inch TV. It was basically like a glorified laptop, but it was like uh, <laughs> just sitting in the background playing the Roseland concert. So yes. Formative, mm-hmm. formative. Mm-hmm. This is why we need things like, there used to be like MTV Unplugged or VH1 storytellers where you would get intimate moments out of people who don't often deliver them anymore. Like Beyonce has no reason to give a small show. I miss things like that. Yeah. There was there was a there was an interview. Was it you that sent it to our our group chat, Lewis? It was like Beyonce interviewing Pink on the red carpet. It was like <laughs> a time. It was like a time when not only was Beyonce participating in interview culture, but she was the one doing the interviews. She was like, "Hey, everybody, I'm here with the amazing Pink," and I'm like, "Not Beyonce <laughs> saying I'm here with the amazing Pink, but you." Beyonce Menounos. Yeah. Wow. There was a time. <laughs> There was a time when she was participating in all avenues of celebrity culture, trying to make it yes. happen. And now now it is what it is. Yeah, now she's like untouchable. I actually was watching uh, a video on TikTok of her police escort um, out of Soldier Field. And um, watching it back, knowing that um, my friends and I, who were in VIP, were fighting for our lives to get out of there while Beyonce is literally <laughs> ushered out by the DVD, I was just like, yeah, she's untouchable. There's no I'm getting close to Beyonce. I was like, I mean, the fact that I was as close as I was, I was just like, and there was literally two security guards posted at like the corners of like where we are because they were like, even though there was like this full like half glass wall, they were like, don't even think about even reaching towards. <laughs> don't, don't. Don't. No, you'll be flung 100 yards. Yeah, right. Yes. They said, so, hey, (laughs) you stay back there. You stay right there. The seat you paid for. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Sit. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Wait, Shay, speaking of formative experiences, I'm curious if you've ever gone on the record about sharing the stage with Jill Kim Booster in a production of Little Shop of Horrors back in the day. Um, no. He talks talks about this constantly. Honestly, it was a really like formative time for me as well because, you know, it's it, it was just so crazy. He was driving. First of all, he was driving like I want to say at this time this was maybe two thousand and five, and he was driving like a nineteen like eighty five Honda gray Honda Civic stick ship that like <laughs> never really came to a full stop like that's <laughs> it's how still moving bad, now yeah. like, the, it was like always like a real california roll through like any stop sign we would always have to take back roads and like avoid like stop lights to get home from rehearsal and like now that i think about that i was like that was so stupid and dangerous but <laughs> whatever gay culture um, would have taken a real hit had you guys rolled I, off the hill <laughs> I, I know there's there's this crazy windy road called River Road that just like literally went next to this river. Now I'm like, there's so many opportunities if we like those brakes really didn't work, we would have honestly just gone right off a Grace Kelly situation. Yeah, yeah, Yeah. that just really would have been it. 
Um, but it was such a good time. It was this place called Only a Stage. We had this director named Margo. May she rest in peace. And we just, I remember we just thought that we were so cool because like everyone else, at, we went to Plainfield Central High School. Mm -hmm. um, also the high school of Melissa McCarthy. I was literally you know. going to say that. Yes, she is. Hey. Wow. Yes. So, you know, they're really putting out some heavy hitters <laughs> in Plainfield, <laughs> Illinois. <laughs> Um, but we thought we were so cool because, you know, like we were, we were also doing, um, oh gosh, what was the show? I think it was like, it's either like Bye Bye Birdie or um, Fiddler on the Roof at like the same time. And we're all like, you know, yeah, we're just like such serious young high school actors that, you know, we're, <laughs> we're, we're doing two shows at once. You know, we yeah. do one in school and then we do one out of school, you know, because That's we're just... Fans. Yeah, we're just such thespians and we're just so booked when literally it, it was just that only a stage just like needed boys. So they were like, um, we found three. So here they are. <laughs> yeah. But we were like, yeah, Pack them all into one so stick shift. Mad. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you were Audrey too and he was Seymour. I love it. I want to see yes. you restaged. I restage honestly, it. I'm not even joking. I would do that in a heartbeat. Also, it's a show it that keeps coming here. back in various forms and people are still obsessed with it. So you're pretending like this is something that couldn't happen. It probably should happen. It will happen. You know what? Yes, we should get we should start talking about it now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm into it. No, wait, I'm like, let's get back into it. Speaking of music, we have to get into your album because I'm, I'm always fascinated by drag queens making uh, from RuPaul making music because it's just a completely different instinct than anything that goes into, for instance, being successful on that show. And I'm wondering if there's mm -hmm. literally any overlap in terms of what you have to do to be successful on Drag Race and what you have to do to fulfill yourself as a musical artist. Gosh, that that's a good question. I feel like, honestly, the major overlap is to just do what feels natural and what feels most authentic to you. You know, it's just, music is such a subjective thing. So at the end of the day, the only thing that you have is your own unique individual point of view and your voice and what it is that you wanna put out there to the world. So that's like, you know, that's the that's the best thing that you can do and in and, and any form of like art and entertainment. It's like, we all have our own individual lane and it becomes very easy to make comparisons to your contemporaries. But the, the best advice that I have um, is to just, you know, stick to what feels most natural and authentic to you. And I think that that's why it took me so long to figure out how to write an album. Cause I still was trying to figure out as far as music was concerned, what felt natural and authentic to me. I think that like what's what's so clear about you when you're performing like is that you truly do like feel your own fantasy like there's a commitment and like there's like you are so galvanized when you perform that especially like for example like on All Stars five when you came out and they did that final talent show it was like mm -hmm. oh well there's one person here who's like actually a pop star and that you th <laughs> and I, I would imagine that that is because like like you're just really committed to that fantasy and that thing, but is it Beyonce and was it like her as an artist? And is it like artists like her that like sort of you picture your in your own mind when you're performing? Like, I wonder who those people are. Oh, absolutely. I definitely studied at the school of Beyonce, Giselle Knowles Carter. Um, mm -hmm. I'm always trying to like, you know, channel that type of energy from like her. Um, Janet Jackson, mm. um, that reads. Sierra, you know, it's, it's really the stage presence for me. And, and, um, I spent so much time growing up, like with whatever free time I had watching music videos, learning the choreography, like practicing in the mirror, trying to make sure that like, I was like serving and I was like giving that same type of like energy and like sparkle and like star quality that I saw from like all of the people that I looked up to. And I think that that's what's um, really important and I always try and bring forth is that love and that joy. And I feel, and like, that's what I feel like draws me to very specific artists like Beyonce. It's like, she stands out there, she gets on that stage and you feel that like sparkle, you feel the joy. that the joy and the love of just like being up there and like commanding a space and like 
bringing people into your fantasy because it's like that's where the power comes from it's like we all have we all have these dreams and these moments where we like you know uh uh put ourselves into these situations where you know we're the pop star you know like we're that girl um but manifesting that in like a real way in which other people feel that too is where like you know it it, it changes it becomes really really special and so you feel that shift when like people are on the journey with you so i always try and make sure that i put that amount of energy forward because when you when it clicks and like the room shifts and like everyone's like on the ride with you like that's where i feel like the true like high of being a performer do you have a favorite definitive janet jackson video moment that you would maybe watch or rewatch? Um, I would say, I would say it would be the doesn't really matter music video oh, from yes. the Nutty Professor soundtrack. Um, all that choreography on that like sliding platform that her and like the dancers were on. Girl, I was, I was sliding all around the hardwood floors <laughs> in my kitchen <laughs> to that on MTV and like 106 in Park, trying yep. to recreate that shit. Like that was my jam, and also all for you and all night don't stop and oh. um rock you but you know janet just janet rock all with you night is a very... don't stop mm, yes mm. bitch that like that's my like when i am like walking down the sidewalk i'm just like you know what i just like need to like feel it right now that's the song that i put on the moment i hear that this is sick i'm like let's go bitch and i'm like everybody out of my <laughs> yeah <laughs> That's, that's also it's a gnarly bass. Yeah, it, you know, it's also it actually starts swishing. I'm like, yes, let's go. It's also one of her most Sierra-ish songs. You know, that like hard as a motherfucker, like watch me dance my mm. ass off uh, song. I also want to say about doesn't really matter. Once upon a time, we used to have this amazing show called Making the Video that would give you a behind mm -hmm, the scenes mm -hmm, peek at mm -hmm. videos like that. So you literally could learn how to kind of do those moves. Like they wanted to teach us to be Janet Jackson once upon a time. Now you have to like yeah. do all this work yourself finding YouTube videos and things. Yes. Oh, that was such a good time. I loved watching Making the Video. Oh, so good. She really also made the words nutty, nutty, nutty for you feel like they deserved. <laughs> oh, Janet's place. gross. And Janet's pop. gross. Yes. She's gross. Say. I'm nutty, yeah. nutty. And also, you know what? Not for nothing, but turned a performance in the Nutty Professor to the clumps. Like, yes. you know. Janet, an American treasure. <laughs> love her. Uh, love, love, love her. I want to ask just about your relationship to Drag Race, the show, just in general, because among reality shows, it's not like any other, like, it's not like a American Idol or Project Runway where the whole point is, oh, yeah, I started there once upon a time. And then, you know, you're just you're like, like, as a drag queen, it's wrapped into what you do. You come back to it unexpectedly or expectedly at certain times visiting it. Is it something where in your future you're just like, I can expect to be on that show like three or four more times or just how do you think of the show as time has gone on and you've already won it? So in, other, in, in a way, like your, your time with the show has already has this major peak. Yeah, one thing that one of the producers over at WOW said to me, um, and this was like earlier on, like uh, this is after season nine, because they had asked me to... Um, come back for All Stars 3 and 4. Um, but literally they, they were filming like All Stars 3 like honestly right after season nine finished um, airing. And I was just like, y'all, I've used all my clothes. I don't have, any, I don't have yeah. anything left. And All Stars 4, I still wasn't ready, but they were like, you know what? Like when you're ready, they're like, take your time. They're all like, think about it. Honestly, it's like a soap opera. You know, like once we introduce mm. these characters, they can come in and out and visit and you know play these roles and you know come and do the thing and that's kind of what it is that's why there's like you know a revolving door you know like an open door policy because you never know when like they're going to want like what this specific girl offers to come like back into the workroom so um baby who knows you yeah. never know when you might see me on that show again so it's just kind of one of those things and I wonder, like, um, with the format that they used for the all winners, do you feel like amongst your peers in the drag race community, those who've been on the show, like, do you think that that sort of opened up the door for people wanting to come back? Because it's not like you're going to go there and get eliminated. Like, do you think we could see some surprising returns that maybe would not have happened had that not been introduced? Yeah, I think mm. so. Um, I 
uh, well, little birdies. Okay, I don't know, I, <laughs> there have been girls who have been talking, saying that you know, obviously there are other All Star seasons that will be coming down the the pipeline. But what I've heard is that a lot of girls were <laughs> very adamant about trying to get the All Star Seven treatment because they're right. like, it's a really great idea. Yeah. How about we uh, just kind of like make that the thing now so that we don't destroy our interpersonal relationships with each other by having to choose each other's lipsticks and send one another home and then get attacked by their fans. Yeah, and waste so, all this money. Yeah, no I kidding. know. So, um, I because honestly, I feel like it, it, as far as All Stars is concerned, it's really a great way to just go about like bringing the girls back and really giving them um, the opportunity to truly showcase themselves again and showcase like all of the money that gets invested into the looks for these runways. So um, hopefully we do get more of that. I think it was a great idea. And honestly, um, being one of the uh, guinea pigs, so to speak, in like that new format, um, it allowed us, I felt, to become closer than mm. I had with any other cast previous because it was all of us mm. from the beginning to the very end. You know what I'm saying? So it and it all gave us like the same amount of like closure with the experience too. So um, I did really, really, really like that. I guess uh, my final question for you is: Do you have any um, fellow contestant friendships that I don't want to say you're surprised to have, but are you close with anybody where you realize I? I'm surprised to call them among the, you know, my kind of closest confidants in the history of the show. Oh my gosh. Um, uh, I would say, honestly, after season nine and my like, touring got very, very close with um, Pheromone. And I mm. think that a lot of people don't realize uh, how we've got on vacations together, you know, our like video game buddies together, mm. you know, all of that, like, Take honestly, like when I go to LA, she's one of the first people that I hit up when I'm there. So I would say that she would probably be the most surprising one because no one really saw the relationship that we had also developed off camera um, on season nine. And then I would say, oh, somebody else that I really fucking love. And, and that's what touring provides. And I love getting a chance to tour with the girls. Um, Jan, I fucking mm. love Jan. I live for Jan. Is incredible. She is hilarious. Like, you know, like she, she enjoys the same amount. She ingests housewives the same way, you know, just like <laughs> a lot of the same pop cultural references and things that like I'm obsessed with. We have so many things in common and just like absolutely adore Jan. And she's so incredibly talented. So, yeah, she really, I think Jan is one that gets it a lot more mm -hmm. than people who watch the show might think. You know what exactly. I mean? It's like you watch the show and it gives that sort of Tracy Flick, you know, <laughs> yes. Rachel Berry vibe. And then yes. she's so aware of that trope and so into playing it that like, yeah. I wish that's something that people knew about Janice. She really is super, Same. super smart and aware and incredibly gifted. Yes. And just cool. Loved yeah. her. Uh, yeah, she was in the Madonna musical, right? In the first, she played uh -huh. the. She did the Lucky Star portion. That was a. a yes. Yeah. I, I'm very picky about my uh, tributes to Madonna. I thought she she brought the yeah. fire in that moment. <laughs> Shay, thank you so much for being here. You were uh, fabulous as expected, and we can't wait to not just see more of you, but hear more of you. Again, this album is so fab. So yes. guys, go and listen to it. Thank you so much. I had such a blast. I'm going to. Um, go and curl back up on the couch now and draw the blinds. Yeah, um, good luck with and... your withdrawal. <laughs> yes, and just continue watching the horrors of Dolores Roach. So, <laughs> what a glimpse into your life! Thank you for that. Yes, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yes. This episode is brought to you by Karyuma, the cool, sustainable sneaker company with old school style and new school ethics. Karyuma is B Corp certified and has a dedicated reforestation program based in the Brazilian rainforest. Their co-founders, David and Fernando, both grew up there, so this project is especially close to home. For every pair of sneakers sold, Karyuma plants two trees, and they've already planted over two million trees to date. I have so many pairs of Karyumas in my home, and there's just a whole orchard in my name somewhere. You've got a Karyum mound of sneakers. I guess. <laughs> We all need a staple sneaker for the summertime with over 40,000 five-star reviews and a just-cleared 94,000 deep wait list. These shoes keep breaking the internet. 
Karyuma's got you covered with shoes that have a classic look and are crazy comfy, consciously crafted for your ultimate daily summer shoe. From paparazzi shots to guys in the office, these sneakers are everywhere, and for good reason. Akka is Karyuma's new school take on a timeless sneaker style. With a seasonless design and ultimate comfort, this pair is sure to become your next daily staple. They're made with organic cotton canvas and come in everyday neutrals like white and gray and the perfect summer pops of color like fuchsia and yellow. This classic design now comes in LWG certified premium leather for a luxurious, lived-in look. And for a sustainable take on the classic style, Nyoka canvas has just what you've been looking for. This 100% vegan design is made with organic cotton canvas and has a classic look with a heritage feel. Made for life on and off the board, Nyaka Canvas may just be your new go-tos for a summer packed with fun and full of adventure. I just got a new pair of gray uh, Kiriuma shoes. Love them. Here's my question for you, Ira. What is your favorite color combo to wear? I love gray and beige. And the reason is those are the two turtleneck colors that Candace Bergen favors. What about you? Wow. Uh, <laughs> you know, um... I like to dress like America's ongoing struggle, so I favor black and white. Oh, sure. Uh, Ebony and ivory, as we once would call that. Yes. Yeah. Everyone loves calling me the captain. Okay. But you know what? Just a little bit to Neil. I see. Oh, (laughs) didn't know that. (laughs) <laughs> little muskrat love for Myra today. Karyuma ships all their sneakers free and fast in the U.S. and offers worldwide shipping and 60-day free returns. They deliver right to your front door using single box recycled packaging. And for a limited time, Keep It listeners can get an exclusive 15% off your pair of Karyuma sneakers. Go to C-A-R-I-U-M-A dot com slash keep it to get 15% off. That's C-A-R-I-U-M-A dot com slash keep it for 15% off only for a limited time. Okay, speed round. Barbie and Oppenheimer were both released. Matt, I think, ultimately would choose Barbie as his favorite of Barbie or Oppenheimer. I I think I actually would choose Oppenheimer, which I am sorry to say about myself, but that's just the way it Mm. is this time. Um, (laughs) Let's now go through famous dual releases in history and pick winners. We'll start rather recently, 2019. Star Wars Episode Nine: The Rise of Skywalker, and Cats, go. Oh, it's going to be uh, Skywalker for me. I actually thought there was more drag in that movie than there was in Cats. Um, I thought that there was actually more like stunty costumeness. I'll never forget where I was when Adam Driver and Daisy Ridley embraced and kissed at the end of the movie. I screamed like a faggot. Um, okay. That's my pick. Cats I, I find when you scream, scream like a faggot. I find when you scream, it's often like that. Also, Meech, pitch, have you heard me on a roller coaster? Honey, we're sisters. I have, actually. It's, yes. really, it, it, it's really something. I say I sound like an old woman getting robbed. Yeah. Um, you let something go at Six Flags Magic Mountain. You really do. Right. Uh, the true me, I would say. We should return. Uh, yes, I'm, it's about that time. I am going to go Cats because it's just not every day you get a movie co-starring Judy Dench and Jason Derulo. I'm sorry. I think you messed up here. <laughs> Moving on. I get it. I get it. 2015. Pitch Perfect 2. And Mad Max Fury Road, Matt. Oh, this this is a no brainer for me. Mad Max Fury Road was actually my favorite film of the year, and I am allergic to the Pitch Perfect movies. Oh, I do not like them. And someone who you, I'm someone who you think might be like, yeah, those are fun. I cannot stand the Pitch Perfect movies. I can't. Well, can't, Pitch. Can't, I have can't. to say about the Pitch Perfect movies, like they were sort of introduced as like for everybody, but I would personally say those movies are for little kids. You know, just oh, like the yeah. nature of it's so body. You know what I mean? I yeah, will say like I am one of the few. Trolls. I am one of the few people on earth who thought Mad Max Fury Road was totally boring. I can't explain it. I wanted to get out of that movie as soon as I can, and I support female directors, so it's Pitch Perfect two for me, and you're a sexist. Um, yeah, I guess so. Uh, next, let's see here. Did you hear about the Morgans? LOL. <laughs> and Avatar. <laughs> You know, I haven't really heard about the Morgans. I can't say I'm someone who's taken that movie in. Uh Um, I I certainly, I don't know if it was because I enjoyed it this much or because I was like this much of a a person that wanted to be in the world of what was happening. I think I saw that first Avatar movie in theaters like three times. Well, you have Um, a sickness. You are part Navi. Again, not because I think it's really good, but because I was like, this is something we as a culture are doing. And I saw The Way of Water twice, which I didn't even really like that much. But I like participating in Avatar culture. I will also choose Avatar because you're right. Like, I just had to go see it. I had no interest in it. But I'm like, okay, this looks like an illustration on a box of colored pencils. So I'm going to go and 
enjoy majesty and blueness you know what i mean did you go more than once no i went with my then roommate leonard if you're listening leonard hello and i was baffled to be there in glendale but i experienced it i was i felt not that i disliked the movie but i felt hoodwinked i felt like i can't believe i'm here you know it's 2009 i should be watching my movies like an education or precious or something I and know. i was in that I, theater i remember do you remember zoe saldana's oscar buzz yes oh silly times silly times <laughs> Okay, here's the most famous example, The Dark Knight or Mamma Mia. Yeah, so The, the Dark Knight is one of my favorite movies ever. I remember I, I, went, to, I went to college. Well, at the time, anyway. Yeah. I went to college at, when I was a freshman at NYU, and I had a huge poster of Heath Ledger as the Joker, and I put it above my bed. And I just want to say to my college roommate at the time, Alex Pack, I am so sorry. Because you had yeah, to wake up fuck? every morning and look at the Joker. And that was something I didn't even think about till years later, and a chill ran up my spine. Just know I was so closeted and trying so hard. Alex, I deeply apologize. I still do pick The Dark Knight. Oh, nothing makes me want to fuck out my college hormones like Heath Ledger's bloody white painted face you are a real asshole i am it was horrible it was oppressive and i probably should have been kicked out of the dorm i feel you know what i will say about mamma mia i do listen to the winner takes it all by meryl streep a lot i i honestly prefer the amanda uh, seyfried version of the name of the game to the original recording which feels very um sad to say um yeah uh the dark knight it did feel longish to me at the time, but the performances I do think are impeccable. Meryl does make me laugh in Mamma Mia, but I generally think the second Mamma Mia improved just the narrative <gasps> quality of the film. So I'm going to say The Dark Knight is also better than Mamma Mia. Mamma Mia, the thing, what, what I always appreciate about Meryl and Mamma Mia is she doesn't sell that out for a fucking second. She gives she gives that movie a Meryl Streep performance. Oh, yeah. And she's also I, I'm gorgeous in the movie, too. I just she's love amazing. looking at her in the movie. Um, Star. Oh, here's a good one for you. Happy Feet or Casino Royale? <laughs> I'm just going to give this to Happy Feet because I love when Nicole Kidman can get in the booth. I know that she has fun in the booth. You know what I mean? More of Nicole in the booth. And it was easy. Like, if she could go get her part out in two days, she can go home to Keith. Right. I have to go with Casino Royale because we were once upon a time so excited about Eva Green. And that was. Oh, wow. I, I think that is truly the only Bond girl. Wow. As written on the page, that is it, very exciting. Like the lines, yeah. the wittiness of the performance, the wittiness of the banter between her and Daniel Craig. Um, I would also say the Italian portion of that movie is way better than the Italian portion we get in Mission Impossible, even though I generally like the Mission Impossible movie. Mm -hmm. the, the I mean, that, so... In terms of Bond girls, is she, so she's your most favorite contemporary Bond girl? Y yes, Vesper Lind, yes. Who would you pick? Yeah, I guess that's fitting. Um, hmm, I mean, I do. I did love me some Ada de Armas in that last one. But oh, the role she was great. Really big enough. Yeah, yeah, that was like a seven-minute performance. Yeah. Yeah, I think that ultimately she probably was robbed of a bigger part, but that there was not one there. But I think that she um, was great. But yeah, let's give it to Eva because actually I can't even remember who it was in Skyfall. Who was it in Skyfall? That's my favorite Bond movie, but who was the Bond There's girl? There's no that? Bond girl in that movie. I think that was specifically like like Judy Dench was sort of the Bond girl. I see. Yeah. Okay. Well, heard I, of feminism? In, Moving on. I, I I can in good conscience say that Judy Dench is my favorite Bond girl. It's okay. Just, the whore in me is up too upset. Wow. Um. Let's see here. Ten things I hate about you or The Matrix. Actually, this is a compelling one. That's a really good one because both those movies are probably like at the time like uh, on face value like way better than they should have been. Yeah. Um I would give it to 10 things I hate about you because of personal tonal preference, but The Matrix is a classic. Um Happy Keanu became the sort of respected thespian he became in The Ma Matrix after being sort of a punchline for years even though he was in things like My Own Private Idaho. My mm -hmm. thing about 10 Things I Hate About You is that I do think, and I actually have loved Julia Stiles and things before, I think she uh. and Larissa Olenek are bad in that movie. Like, the line do readings, you? I'm like, oh, God. Like, who taught these people how to be sardonic? I would rather watch Garfield do these lines. I think Ju I think they both pull it off. And I actually, like, I remember thinking when I was younger watching the movie and she does that, uh, you know, she reads her poem aloud in class. I remember thinking, acting. Got it. 
Um, so at least for a young gay Matt Rogers, it was acting. We're going back to 1989 now. Batman the original with Jack Nicholson. Do you have that poster up yeah. in your dorm room, you fucking freak? <laughs> or Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Oh, man. Honey, I Shrunk the Kids is like... Uh, that's like a, a theme park playtime culture in a way that I really respond to. I really do like Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. I think it's inventive. But I probably would give it to Batman just because we get that delish... Um, Jack Nicholson performance, Kim Basinger, um, you know, she she certainly is in it. Right. And Michael Keaton, I think, might be the hottest Batman. Love that take. Yes, as a, a friend of mine once said about um, Kim Basinger, Kim Basinger, good in a movie, is the same thing as Kim Basinger, bad in a movie. So, yeah. you know, like, like you won an Oscar for one movie, and then otherwise we would put you in these horrible movies with uh, Alec Baldwin, but it, they're kind of the same. So also Singular. we put her in the movie The Natural for some reason. Something to think about. Uh, Remember and, her in Eight Mile? Yes. What a crazy casting choice. She is in Eight she's, Mile. She's fully in Eight Mile. And the last one I will pick, A Fish Called Wanda, 1988, or Die Hard. Mm. It's going to be A Fish Called Wanda for me. For, for the performances, I have to say. No, no disrespect, of course, to Alan Rickman or Reginald Val Johnson. But... Um, Kevin Klein being, can you, has anybody ever been both hot and zany like Kevin Klein? It simply isn't done. Honestly, you could say that for Jamie Lee Curtis in the film. True. Yes. Oh, and of course she's very hot in True Lies. True Lies and also zany. Yeah. Yeah. I would say they were kind of perfect together. Right. Um, yeah. That's a very singular movie and sensation. Like everybody went and fucking saw A Fish Called Wanda. Um, oh, I am going to go for the days. I know. Oh God, your lips to God's ear, sweetie. Um, well, that was entertaining. I'm glad we did that. When we come back, <laughs> it's keep it. And now we come to my favorite segment of the show. It's also the only segment of the show with the name. It's also the name of the podcast. It's keep it, which as I'm thinking about it right now is ultimately too close to, I don't think so, honey, uh, a part of your podcast. And I feel bad about that. I've never thought about that until right now. I don't think that anyone needs to feel bad because I think if you listen to any podcast, they have some version of this. That's true. And it's, it's something I've accepted, and um, it's chalking up to both of our unoriginality. Okay, good. As long as you're not speaking to your lawyers, we can continue with this conversation. <laughs> Matt, we will begin with your keep it. What's your keep it this week? My keep it this week is the concept of SEMA on and just like that because she is merely a concept i think that there's so many things you could say about it and just like that 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 i would like uh the world to keep uh -huh. but i think i've reached a point with the show where i know what triggers me so much about it and it is sema okay now there's there's many reasons for this um there was i find the actress sarita chowdhury to be talented. I remember she played Mandy Patinkin's wife in Homeland, and I thought she gave like a good performance in that show. This actress is out of her genre. Mm, like it, mm. it is, it, and I think that that is something I, I, I don't, I, it, I don't put it against her. It's just that like, it's not good casting. And then I just go to like with, with, and just like that in general, it's like a lack of thoughtfulness in the casting and writing of these new characters where I ultimately just feel bad for these actresses who are under contract. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, Karen Pittman, whose character Naya is going through a divorce in the show, we only know that because she gets a text at dinner that she has to deal with, and she's texting while the other women have a conversation, and then she puts her phone down and says, oh, done, that's dealt with. And none of the women ask about it or ask how she's doing. That The reason this connects back to Seema is we you spend so much time with Seema right. and nothing happens. So it's just like, we're supposed to think this character who's like essentially like a shadow of what Samantha was. You can tell in the way they write her. Right, yes. Uh -huh. Like that we're supposed to like care about this character or invest in her relationship with Carrie, which I also don't understand because those two actresses have no chemistry. To the point where it's like, why are we digging into this one as the new like character that's popping. She is not popping. And I just think like when you zoom out of in just like that in general, the symptom like of them like creating this 
new diverse world that our old characters are interacting with. It's like, well, if you're not going to actually care about the new characters that you write and imbue them with any like, you know, identifiable like characteristics that are all their own, then like, what are we doing it for if not just to write at the idea of diversity and inclusion in this new New York? Like we could have a show here that would be really straightforward, which is just Carrie, Miranda, and Charlotte interacting with a new New York or a more diverse, like, you know, a uh, vibrant New York than we've seen them. And we wouldn't be wasting the time of these actresses with these characters that are written like, so pathetically, I mean, LTW and her husband, every scene they're in is written like an episode of Sesame Street. It's like, it's really crazy. And Seema is the one that I think is the is the biggest problem because we spend the most time with her. Mm, I see, I see, I see. You actually used a word that puts a finger on what I think the problem with this show is in general, which is to me that, and just like that, has no genre. Like it's not no. dramatic enough or funny enough or really like sure of itself in any way where I can tune in and, th and think, oh, I know I'm getting besides good performances from beloved actresses. And I am truly a huge Sarah Jessica Parker stan and oh, a yeah. huge Cynthia Nixon stan. Love. Like, like I could watch them all day. I have loved them since they were children. I love yeah. Sarah Jessica Parker in Girls Just Want to Have Fun in Square Pegs. I love Cynthia Nixon in Little Darlings. I have loved everything they've done since. On this show, there's just a static quality. And I feel like in the last couple of episodes that I've not seen yet, I've heard it makes motions to be a little bit more like the original Sex in the City in a way that I guess we've all been craving. But otherwise, there's just nothing. There, uh, there's no there there. And just like nothing. And just like who, yeah. who cares? You know what I'm saying? I hate seeing Sarah Jessica so bored. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's right. just like, and she's got so much sparkle that like, I just, I, I, I'm not seeing it in the show and it's frustrating because I, I just keep going back to it. Also, again, she spends so much time with Seema and almost no time with Cynthia and Kristen. Like you just, you see, you see these dynamics just feel like wasted. And it's like, here we are in episode six, I believe episode seven is coming out this week. And it's like, there's going to be three, four more episodes like, to potentially get what we want to see. And like, you're literally watching it and Cynthia Nixon is so cut off from the main action of the show because she's off in Shea World. Right. That it's Which just is a like, world, by the way. And a, a theme oof. park that I, you should not visit. It feels like, it feels just as like stark as the Barbie world in the real world, honestly. It feels like <laughs> the rules might apply. It's, and it's just like, I, when one thing I notice about almost every scene of And Just Like That is it ends on buttons that aren't buttons. Like, it ends, like, anyone that's been in a writer's room knows, like, okay, we wrote the first version of this scene and we'll all pitch buttons. It's almost like they forgot that part. Like, the scenes that, they, they end on no joke. And there's also a really crazy lack of scoring in the show. So right. it has no yes. forward motion. Yes. There's no music. There's no... um. Which, which actually takes out, like, the tonality in general. And I think it really could help here. Like, I actually think some music cues and, like, some whimsy in the show could really help us feel less adrift when watching it because it's like you said, the, the genre is unclear. Right. Because you've got one scene or one whole thread of the last episode, which is, like, comedic thread that um, Charlotte has, and then you cut Smash directly into this, like, devastating, like, fight between um, Miranda and Steve, which is like, wait, this is the show, mm -hmm. or is it that show? But then the, but then you're with Seema, and I'm like, what's, what? It's just, it's eight different shows. It doesn't have enough time for itself or what it's set out to do. It's just it makes you wish it kind of just turned into a third movie. You know what I mean? Like and gave each of the main characters another great moment, something to do. But now we're like stretched thin, not knowing why we're hanging around these people or who these new people are. Or, you know, it's just all sandwiched together, unfortunately. I don't buy any of the new friendships. Yeah. I just don't buy them. I it feels it feels like they had to make new friends. Right. No, <laughs> totally. Totally. Um my keep it this week is unfortunately very expected. I like to go off the wall with these, but my keep it this week is that Twitter is now called fucking X. I know you yeah. left Twitter a long time ago, but just, mm. first of all, I feel guilty enough still tweeting. I'm, I'm sorry. I've just built my entire life and like 
really, I, I have never thought about this till now, my career off of Twitter. You know what I mean? Like, that's when I started to, like, make jokes or, like, tweet through award shows. And now I write through for award shows. So it's like, you know, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm unfortunately thankful to what Twitter was, even though, you know, it's, you know... Uh, a, a lava pit. I mean, I don't know why. There's not much to say in in support of what Twitter is, other than you can right. meet. I've met a lot of my friends on it. Um, a lot of funny people still lingering around the edges of Twitter, even though it's like I think for most people who are you know in their 30s like us, gay guys, it's just a porn haven. Like that's what you mainly it's use it for. That, yeah. yeah, and it definitely did not used to be that. But anyway, uh, I, it's just so shocking to me that every choice Elon Musk makes makes the site mm. worse. Not one choice. I mean, it's just like, I'm, I'm not saying I've ever conferred the idea of intelligence on him, but I'm saying mm-hmm. you would think for somebody who would unnecessarily buy a social media platform, he would have an idea or two that were interesting for it, and we just have not run into even one interesting... And now we're supposed to not only call it X, tweets are now called Zeets, X-E-E-T, which is, I'm excited for the Scrabble community, I, mm. I, you know, it's rare that you get to start with an X and then go to a four letter place. You know what I mean? You get to, you get a yeah. couple of Greek letters here and there, but rarely do you get X blank, blank, blank. And that, that's my, um, that's also my shout out to my late grandmother who is a Scrabble fanatic. Um, she would have, she would appreciate this too. Actually, before we move on, I want to say, so I was at my grandmother's funeral last week and my aunt, Anne, who listens to this podcast, she goes, did you, she goes, I, I meant to tell you this for a long time. And this is the good thing about going to a funeral. You hear things like this. She goes, uh-huh. Lewis, did you know that I took your grandma to see The Crying Game? Uh, and she, I was like, uh, no. And she goes, and do you know what she was like afterwards? She said, and it was a man. And I couldn't <laughs> believe it. Was it because you had just brought up The Crying Game? I on guess so. Can it? you imagine? I brought up The Crying Game. But um, I just want to say... If you're going to a funeral coming up, find these stories. People interact with yeah. pop culture in ways you don't expect. You may not know. You know? My thing with um, the X of it all and the Elon Musk with Twitter of it all is if you really just think about it in the most base way, it's like this is a man with no social grace or social intelligence or social ability. And also nothing to who do. Is in charge of a social media site. And so I think it's actually way more simple than it than it should be, which is that you have to have someone who's actually interested and capable of social interaction that like is w- to have insight into things like this because every decision that's made about this social networking site now is made by a robot human. And I think that's what takes it further and further and further away from what made it exciting and interesting and valid in the first place. And like, for example, the limitation on tweets you can see. Right. The um, the unnecessary branding. It's just all it, it's 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 decisions that are being made by someone with a lack of point of view about the thing because he bought it because of ego. Right. And that's going to obviously he make, destroy the side. Yes, every yeah. decision he makes is also vindictive too. So like that's that's woven into it. Let's not forget also that the glyph he chose to represent the site, the X, was in fact stolen and you can't steal that. And then also... Seriously? Yes, and that also X is trademarked by Meta which you can't so he's just like doing things left and right that he didn't check with any anybody about it's just i would say it's mind-blowing but of course it's utterly expected fool i also i haven't been able to have um real fun on that site for a long time because my tweet style back in the day was sort of um chaotic run-on sentence idiot oh and so a little kerouac yeah you can't you can't you can't really do that nowadays on twitter because people are like what's wrong (laughs) you know what i mean it's like it's like unclear like it's just it's just not a you see your tweets it's just kind of just like there's like a joke structure there is like an observation etc so yeah i'm writing like monologue thrive- yes i write like monologue jokes from 2005 yes that just happen to end in the words juliette binoche to make it right. lewisy you know what i'm saying and so i still do think it's a place for you as long as you want it to be but oh, for me you. it's just kind of like it's i i, I don't think I, there's there's too much i i i'm not uh, it's not I'm productive not willing... for most productive people i will say <laughs> But I don't know. I mean, like, do you th- do you think it's done? I thought it was done for like six months now, but it feels like 
here we sit. No, and well, it feels like the end of the movie Tar, where um, you know she's in that boat, and and the guy says uh, uh, the crocodiles escaped from that movie, and they survived. You know, the crocodiles yeah. survive. Monsters live on. So who knows? The crocodiles being named uh, what's her name, Linda Yaccarino. I did like seeing that name pop up all over Twitter. Linda Yaccarino was, I believe, the name of the woman who's like so, the PR person in charge of Twitter, and she was tweeting, and it was just like. X will usher in the new the new way of communication, and it's just like it felt very like Terminator Two. Yes. I'm gonna say thank you, you know, the it, lady president from The Giver or some other yeah, dystopia. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It it it's to rename this X and like commit to like the Cyberdyne branding of it all feels very like you know we saw this science fiction movie, right? Like yes. you know that this is like you're not even you're not even trying to not look nefarious. Now yeah. it's called X. It's like black with like a low gray <laughs> font. It's like, so we really do just want to live in an oppressive totalitarian like robot society. No, I, she's somebody, I mean, she, that is where we're headed. She's somebody who stands at a podium and says the future and waits for applause. Yes. 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 Yes, it really is that. Which, it's giving a Universal Studios Hollywood 3D show. <laughs> Which I know you've been on. So you well, in authority on that. Yes, right. They right actually, right. Terminator Two: Battle Across Time 3D was replaced by Despicable Me, Minion Mayhem, and you know. Oh my, I can see a tear <laughs> in your eye. It's crazy. Matt I'm Rogers, really thank you for being here for imparting all your wisdom and everything else you did too. It wasn't all wise, but most of it was great. No, I'm sure I'll hear about your qualms later. But um, thank you for having me. This was fun. Um, Barbenheimer. I'm I'm so happy it happened. Yes, and right. I'm happy it's over. <laughs> right. Yes, I have to say. I mean, like the SAG WGA situation put a halt to the, uh, you know, the marketing these actors can do. And while I'm happy we're all striking, getting what we want, I am deeply relieved we are at the end of that cycle because woo, it was you know just Crayola mayhem. I don't know how much more I, I mean, could take. The thing is, I was like, you know what, like, uh, while I was so perplexed by the whole thing the whole time, like, ultimately it got people really excited to go to the movies. Yes, and, right. And um, there is that, and there has not been that. And so, I truly thought go. only Tom Cruise was capable of, like, you know, uh, inciting that sentiment. And now we have two other examples of it occurring without him, because I don't like, I don't like depending on him. What a weird flop decision, too, like, or mistake that they made to, like, release that so close to the Oppenheimer yeah. uh, release so they would lose all those IMAX theaters. It feels like that's when you make a decision to push it because it's just, like, giving away money. You right. know what I mean? Like, I don't know. Odd. Vanessa Kirby, we love you, girl. And we will see really? you. Really? Yes, of course, always. We will see you next week on Keep It. Keep It.